Good morning, brethren. <clears throat> now, what you're going to hear this morning is, to some extent, a reiteration of things you've heard previously. But I'm not going to preach it to you in a sermon. I am going to uh, pretty much speak these things as one who has received the truths that we've been discussing this morning. I had some preliminary observations that I wanted to make just before uh, I get into some of the more personal notes. One is that even our most noble expressions of love among the sons of men without God, they're but faint and corrupted versions of that true love. They really are. And there are, there are things that, that we could say are, are very noble expressions, you know, people who have thrown themselves on grenades to, to save their comrades and, and people who have, have gone to great extent uh, suffering loss joyfully for others. And yet, compared to the love of God, it's just a dim reflection, at best, in a very dark glass. It's an imperfect expression. And I want to, to uh, pose to you this proposition also, speaking in a figure, that it is the heart that is the organ of understanding and knowledge instead of the mind. Because the mind sets in order the things that the heart has received and known. You know in your own self that there are many times that, that you you know something, you sense something, you're not able to explain it yet. You're not able to set it out perhaps for another person to communicate it adequately, but you have it in you and you operate according to the principle of it even before you can explain it. The, the mind is very limited by what the heart has affection for and faith in. Also, Speaking on a theological note, love is the hermeneutic through which God is rightly perceived, known, and served. Love is the most powerful, and this, now this is a reiteration, but now I, this was in my notes before Brother Jonathan and before Brother Tim and the other brethren got up here. Love is the most powerful constraint the strongest motive, the most effective agent of change, and the most enduring impetus that we operate under. Amen. This is a very large thing. When you think of, of love, you have to think of great expanses. This is, uh, it is impossible to think of God in any capacity completely devoid of, of knowledge of him in love. This, God is love. At no point is he separate from that, from that uh, principle and from that attribute. It says that anyone that loveth knoweth God, and he that loveth not knoweth not God. Now that's a very broad blanket statement. So love is both the means and the measure of our knowledge of God. Now there are implications inherent to love, and that's why we cannot love God and remain unchanged. It is impossible to love God and to remain unchanged. I think in terms of, um, you know, we've heard uh, it's spoken of faith. Well, it's with the heart that we believe unto righteousness. And God knows exactly what he's saying and why he said it that way. And that's the way he expressed it. It's, the confession is made with the mouth. But if you believe in your heart that Jesus is the Son of God, that's whenever it, 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 he comes to you. He dwells in our hearts through faith. But this is the abode of God. This is his preferred residence concerning mankind in our hearts. When, in uh, 1 Kings 3, 9 and 10, speaking of Solomon, this is whenever Solomon had the dream and God asked him to, to tell him what he wanted. 
And he said, Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thy so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And then, of course, he blessed him. In verse 14 it says, And if thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments, as thy father David did walk, then will I lengthen thy days. He was expressing his pleasure that, that Solomon had asked this. But then, unfortunately, in the same book, the 11th chapter, and the second part of verse 3, he had taken to himself many wives and concubines, it says, and his wives turned away his heart. Now that's when Solomon ceased to be wise in many ways. There is a wisdom that is of the earth, earthy, sensual, devilish, but that wisdom that cometh from above is first pure. This comes from God, and this is a company, it's an accompaniment of our love of God. God delights in those who love him, and he abides with those who love him. In reference to obedience, uh, we have an example of, of uh, Pharaoh, it was, and the Lord said unto Moses, when thou goest to return to Egypt, See that thou doest all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thy hand. But I will harden his heart, that he shall not let the people go. He couldn't receive the testimony and the witness, the evident, obvious expression of supernatural power was refused because he had a hard heart. He couldn't see. His eyes saw it, but he couldn't see God in it. He couldn't understand. He couldn't be changed because his heart was hard. Of Rehoboam, Solomon's son, it says, And he did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. That's why he did what was evil. That's why there was no, he didn't obey. Obedience comes from the heart. True obedience, not feigned obedience. That's why people have such a hard time with these concepts of faith and obedience and service and they want to argue about faith and works. Love puts it all together. Amen. Now, um, in Isaiah, God, it, he laments. Speaking of Israel, they have not known nor understood for he hath shut his eyes and they cannot see in their hearts that they cannot understand cannot understand. So that's why I said the heart is the organ of understanding and knowledge concerning God. So far as trust, he's given us the earnest of his spirit. He's given us this earnest in our hearts. It testifies, bears witness with us that we are the children of God. In, um, in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, we read, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. This is the service God accepts and only that service. Everything else, it, you may impress people, but you're not impressing God and you you know in yourself you will not have that assurance when you've when you've done it and it hasn't been from your heart you will receive no assurance or confidence godward afterwards you'll still be in a state of of turmoil and seeking and in um, just well it, it is a sort of torment to to want to have that confidence and have it out of your reach always God must change the heart concerning work and labor. Uh, that We just did that with Rehoboam. Concerning knowledge in uh, Matthew 13. Uh, th this is just the one section that I've, I've gotten some references. The reason I've done this is because I wanted to anchor these concepts in what God has said. Not just stand up here and talk to you as one 
who just thought these things up on, on my own, as though these were my thoughts only. But in Matthew 13, verses 14 and 15, it says, And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they shall see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Until it gets to your heart, it hasn't done the work of God in you. Now love is by definition personal. It's impossible to have an impersonal love. And here there's a direct correlation between how much we love and how much we give ourselves to and for the object of our affection. Amen. Now, <clears throat> I, was, I was thinking of um, an illustration. I, I have to go back to, to my youth, something that I'm not proud of. But since I'm speaking to, to other people, I know that this would be something that is not a, an experience that is unique to myself. Uh, when I was really little, all of you have been blessed with children who are not as hard-headed as I was. I have never met a child that I considered as hard-headed as I was. I was worse than the Energizer Bunny. I could take a beat and keep on ticking. It just wouldn't. It didn't make any difference. I could. This is a fault. Now, I'm not. I'm. Uh, this is a fault that I had, and it was a serious fault in my character. You can beat me. My grandmother had to beat me. We had seven sessions, not spent, you know, not a few swats, and she didn't have those granny paddles I've seen with the with the pedals on the end of them. She had a switch, and I was on the business end of that switch. We went through seven sessions because of something I'd done before she finally got me to say, I'm sorry. But you know what? She didn't really get me to, she got me to mouth, I'm sorry. She didn't really get me to be sorry even after that. It didn't break me. It didn't. And again, now I'm ashamed of what I once was. By the grace of God, I'm not that way today. It's wrong to be that way. So please don't anybody think that that that's a nice or cute or funny or anything else. It was all a deplorable condition that God used the people in my life to help drive out of me. But I also know that the same people who were not able to beat out of me true repentance, if my dad or my mother or anybody I loved was disappointed in me, if I hurt them, it destroyed me. You didn't have to put a finger on me. You could have put my feet in boiling water and I wouldn't have done that again to them. See, it changed my heart. But what was it that changed my heart? It was because I loved them. That's what changed it. Not the force, the love. Now, you know, in the, God has given us, if you, can, if you have a godly mind, and we all can grow in this, you can really interpret your whole life in reference to God and his dealings with you and his, his teaching you of himself, revealing himself to you. He started out in the garden, and he created us in his image. Now, can someone be created in the image of God and be void of love? God is love. Why did God, he had the seraphim and the cherubim and the host of angels, and who knows, we may not even know all of his created beings, the four living beasts. We know some because he's, he's revealed them to us. Why did God need another creature? His heavens were full of praise. The angels praised him. 
Well, God wasn't known the way he wanted to be known. There are things that the angels are still learning today through the redemption of mankind. God is receiving glory. When I say receiving glory, when God is glorified, he is made known. Amen. And God is being made known Amen. through this salvation. Yes. Amen. I've heard people speak of it, and it was a right perspective so far as the truth they were saying. Uh, whenever they're talking about God getting glory, and but you know when that means something to me, I can tell you exactly when that when that. It's not just information. Now, this is the difference between knowledge that puffs up and charity that edifies. Amen. Amen. You can know, you could know more than all of us, the sum total of all of us in the room. You could have memorized the entire word of God verbatim in several translations. You could be able to quote it to us at will. You could be able to correct our grammar. You could be able, you could do anything like that as far as knowledge of the Word of God goes. But if it's not in your heart, you don't have the power of it. Amen. You really are not holding the truth in righteousness, and neither am I. This love is absolutely foundational to everything God is and everything we are in Him. Amen. If we fall short, of loving God, we have fallen short of the salvation that Christ brought to us. God did, I, I, I really appreciated the story Brother Boyce brought the other morning about the young man that thought he was being brought over to be a houseboy. And, and the woman who said, no, I've brought you here to be my son. Amen. See, she loved him. That's the part he didn't understand. He didn't understand the love part. He had to learn the love part. And we're learning the love part. Amen. But when God made Adam, he made him in his own image. Mm -hmm. but he wanted a creature, uh, uh, one of his own. He was creating children to himself. Someone that he could love and someone who could love him back. Amen. Someone like him that could understand this love. Yes. It's one thing. A lot of people know me, and I have this dumb little dog. I love that little dog. Now, not like I love my family, but I love that little dog. That dog has no idea. He knows I feed him. He knows I'm nice to him. He gets happy when he sees me. That dog does not understand the true nature of my affection for him. He's a dog. <laughs> he is. He's just a dog. He can't know that. He's not like me. That's totally different than the people that we, we know and love. They can understand the manner of love. Yes. And they can reciprocate that love. Well, God made Adam so that he could both understand and he could love back. We have that capacity. In fact, not only do we have that capacity, we will love something. It's our nature too. Yes. We will Amen. love something. Amen. Whenever, whenever God created Eve... Now, he was not just creating a smart workhorse for him. He wasn't making a commentary on Adam's culinary abilities. It was none of that. The, the way that, and you noticed, he didn't go out and get another pile of dust to make Eve either. Eve was not a separate creation. She was an extension of the creation God had created. And just as Eve was created out of the rib of Adam. Whenever God created Adam, he didn't, he didn't form the dust and then stand back and say, live. He breathed into him. He imparted himself. He infused himself into the man he had formed. And that's when he became a living soul. Now, if we're going to live, we have to be infused with God. Amen. Amen that was cut off through disobedience. Whenever, see what really happened whenever the, our first parents fell is they didn't love God more than themselves. They loved something else more than God. I'm not gonna go back and psychoanalyze them for a lot of reasons. 
not the least of which I could I could open up myself to a, a very large error and and do it publicly which I would be unprofitable to us all but I do know this that whenever a heart loves God it really doesn't make any difference whether you understand why he said it or not Amen. it's good enough that God said it Amen. and you trust him to do what's good and what's right. You trust his character yes. so that you can say, God would never do anything bad to me. He would never harm me. I know, see that same love gives this confidence that, that you can receive from him and receive it as good no matter what it is. That's why we can give thanks in everything. That's why even when things apparently don't seem to, it, it's good to not be a murmurer because it, it, it fights with this principle. But whenever, no matter what happens, we might not be able to think of, of what God is going to do with that circumstance, but we can always know that God is still there and he has not forsaken us and that he is able to do above what we're able to even think to ask and he is for us. When that, whenever that comes to your heart, God is for you. Well, what can be against you? It's not just a rhetorical question. You have to reason on that. Who or what can be against the one whom God loves? Nothing. It only exists by his goodwill and pleasure and for the time that it serves his purpose and his purpose will serve our purpose also if we're in Christ. Amen. I'm going to uh, I'm going to cut this a little bit short because really many of the speakers have said so well many of the things that I was going to say. But in this thing in in this whole renewal I have looked so forward to it. I wanted to hear what the brethren had to say about God's love <laughs> because it's love it's because it really is because he first loved us our love is a response we didn't initiate it. it's a response to his great love and the power of the truth the power of the truth was effectual to me the day I changed or I should say began to change was when I knew when I understood when I believed that God loved me Amen. and you will change and your faith will increase and your your desire for God will abound and your hope will be made bright and your love of the brethren will be true and you're not going to have to worry about see the law is written in our hearts until it's written in our hearts then then we, it isn't really ours under under the giving of the law it was necessary that God also gave, gave the leaders, uh, Moses in particular, ordinances and statutes so they could understand. Now when I say this, this is what I mean. And then he spelled it out. He had to write a lot of subheadings so that we could kind of understand what the law was, was trying to comprehend. But in Christ, when it's written on our heart, the believer is the commentary. We are, if, if you will, the New Testament statutes and ordinances of the commandments. Mm -hmm. That's where we see it lived out. This is what God means when he says, love one another. You look at the saints. You don't go somewhere and read a list of, okay, that means that if they show up at your house, if it's between the hours of this and this, this is how you treat them. And if it's between the hours of this and this, then you treat them this way. Love constrains you to behave toward the brethren the way Christ would behave but toward the brethren. Amen. And so we are God's commentary on what is written. The apostles wrote that we are the epistles. 
written in your hearts. So, brethren, I want to say first, I love you. I truly do. There's no way to tell people what they mean to me. But it's because you, you are the expression of Christ to me also. I see my Jesus when I see you. And by God's grace, you see Jesus when you see me. It is our highest calling. It is our most profound, profound reward. It's our greatest satisfaction. And brethren, love really doesn't make us ashamed. We will never be ashamed in any sense. We will not fail of our expectation when we get to heaven. Nothing we will have expected from every good we have expected from God is not only sure to us, but we've probably expected too little. That abundant entrance has to do with God saying, you weren't able to think high enough, but it's okay. Enter in. I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to give it to you. And we're not going to be ashamed. There'll be, just as in the judgment, there'll be not a tongue that wags against our Savior and our God. No accuser will lift their voice. We won't be ashamed either in that day. There will be joy, everlasting joy, upon the heads of all God's beloved. And we will see him face to face. Amen.